Okay. Ready? I'm ready, Freddie. <laughs> okay. Coach Tally, welcome to the Football Excellent Podcast. How are you doing? Hey, thanks, Will. Great to be here. Appreciate you uh, asking me. It's an honor and a privilege for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Haven't known each other for a long time, but uh, I feel like I, I know you very, very well just over the past couple of months that we've known each other because of the, the All-Star Bowl in, in Miami that you worked with, the Podium All-Star Bowl, our college senior All-Star game. Uh, you led one of the coaching staffs there. And then also your ties to international football. You know, we, we had some uh, personal contacts, which was cool. Yeah, that was it was a fun time for us and a couple guys on our staff to go down there and be a part of um, the bowl game and uh, just work with the guys. It's, uh, you know, that, you know, being on the field, for, uh, first and foremost, just even practice. I love it. Mm -hmm. No doubt. No doubt. Helping those guys hopefully get to the NFL, you know, progress to their pro career. There's there's nothing really more that um, we can ask for on, on a business and being able to provide that service is a blessing for sure. Absolutely. Thanks for, so, do, thanks for doing that. We appreciate you doing <laughs> that. You know, having been involved with international football for 30 years, I mean, it's it's a growing, as you know, football's growing across the globe. So Definitely, definitely. Well, so as we get into the podcast, you know, the first thing I want to get into, Coach, is what is in the signature of your email? It says double win football and then dash Proverbs 2717. What, what, what do those things mean to you? Yeah, first of all, uh, it goes way back from um, when I was coach or when I was playing and actually didn't really even play there at Pacific Lutheran University, a guy named Frosty Western was my mentor. And mm -hmm. he talked about double win. And then a guy named Dennis Waitley actually wrote a book called Double Win. And certainly his book was about life in general. But Proverbs okay. twenty seven seventeen says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Mm. And uh, it's a great concept. Uh, but I had, I, I finally realized I need to dig deeper into this. Um, when I came back from a, a men's huge gathering back in the early nineties and my wife uh, saw that I was excited for this for football. It was great. And, uh, she goes, you know, that verse is for, uh, husbands and wives as well. Um, so it's very holistic. Wow. Uh, so I, I like that aspect of it. Um, but I, that's where we grab the, uh, the term double win and double win football. If I help you win, I win too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, first off, that's incredible that your wife, you know, made that point to say this applies to your, to your uh, relationship with me as well. And, you know, it, it's cool how it does apply to both, right? Like you guys compliment each other. You guys get to push, push each other to become the best version of yourselves. And the same thing with the football team. You know, Absolutely. every guy's pushing each other, you know, every guy's trying to mold into this, this common goal. And I love that. I love that proverb. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. And, and, and the one thing with that is, uh, you know, ironing, sharpening iron, the knife gets sharper, the sword gets sharper. Right. Mm -hmm. But what happens in the midst of that, it loses a little bit of itself. Mm. Some of that iron comes off and we can see it if you've ever watched a a guy sharpening something on a on a millstone that's turning really fast there's sparks yeah and that's what happens in relationship right there's good sparks there's bad sparks a lot of times we see it as bad but it's it can be good and then the other thing with that is it gets hot you don't want to touch a knife right after it got sharpened on one of those um grindstones that's for sure because there's heat there's friction yeah. Mm -hmm. But friction allows for it to be sharper. And God knew what he was doing, in my opinion, when he came up with that analogy of iron sharpens iron. So. No doubt. No doubt. Well, how, how, do you, how do you practice that proverb, the iron sharpens iron? How do you get that point across to your team and build that culture? To, you know, because I think that's the foundation of a lot of division uh, college programs across the country, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's taken me a while. Uh, I was an assistant here, defensive coordinator for a couple of years and then became the head coach. And so I'm the kind of guy that's always sort of learning and growing and trying to figure out how can we be the best that we can be? How can I be the best that I can be? How can our coaches be the best that they can be? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the midst of that, it's like, how do I insert this into practice? 
And uh, we were going along in practice one day, and a guy, it was a wide receiver and a DB, they were kind of going at it. And uh, I can't remember now specifics, you know, if it was a catch made, the DB was upset or the other way around. And I was like, wait a second, this is opportunity for both sides of the football. If it's the wide receiver that caught the ball and the DB that didn't, let's celebrate the fact that the wide receiver caught the ball and let's help the guy, the DB, if he made a mistake as a coach, mm -hmm. maybe another player, and then both shake hands at the end of it. And uh, I just came up with this other phrase or, um, you know, nowadays is hashtag Warner wins because Warner wins if the guy catches the ball, but the DB makes a mistake because we can help correct that mistake. We want mistakes to happen in practice so we can fix mm. them. And they're still going to happen in a game, but less mistakes in a game. So that's that iron sharpening iron, but doing it in a way that allows for us to have life rather than getting pissed off at each other or mad at or upset or talking smack and all that. Cause that only leads to, you know, negativity in a lot of ways. I have fun with that. I talk smack with the guys, so I'm not saying it's wrong, but yeah, we want to speak life into each other. Yeah. Well, I know you're a players coach you, cause you were dancing with our players at the podium all-star bowl. Oh, getting yeah. Jiggy. That was jiggy awesome. with you, baby, a little Will Smith. You got that a was, Will Smith. Hey man, you had you got the Will Smith moves. <laughs> Fresh not Prince. On, not on video, that's for sure. <laughs> I got Will Smith moves. I got Will Smith moves when he sits on the couch, that's for sure. <laughs> oh man, oh, you can dance. But uh, so, you know, I think with the iron sharpens iron piece, it's about building leaders too, right? And and building leaders on your team so that they can hold others accountable. And that's where that iron sharpens iron piece comes into place. And, you know, so how, what are you doing in your programs to help build leaders and to help build guys that can, you know, help manage the team with you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is uh, just life in general, trying to take the things that happen on the football field to prepare these guys for when they leave, they get that job, they have a wife, they eventually get kids, you know, all those kinds of things. So I, I'm a big teachable moment person. You know, I talked about Frosty Westering. I mean, I could sit there and listen. I mean, I'm a, I'm kind of a kinesthetic guy, move around and all this and that. You've seen a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. But I have a hard time, even if it's a great talk from somebody sitting still. But Frosty, he could just encapture people. And so for me, I have to take my moments where I'm going to talk about this or talk about that. So in regard to specifically your question, um, I do have a map but it's kind of full of a lot of rabbit trails. The biggest mm -hmm. thing right now for our guys is uh, I want them to learn more about life. And then the leaders are going to rise to the top in that, you know, right. doing the small things, you know, the detailed things, whether it's uh, making sure, you know, that the garbage is put out. Right. I mean, stuff like that. Cause if, mm -hmm. if you're having a hard time with that, it starts piling up. I just saw somebody's house the other day. It's like, well, my husband didn't take the garbage out kind of thing and and uh you know it's like okay <laughs> those are small things so if they have a hard very, time doing that on the football field then they may have a hard time doing that in in life as well um, right you know so the whole leadership thing i do have a group of men i call it the board of trustees again like a business right and mm -hmm. uh, so i work with those guys more specifically uh from that perspective and then everybody has a chance to be a leader and certainly everybody has a chance to be a follower. And that's sometimes that's even more important. And, and, and what do you mean by that? You know, by sometimes following being more important than leading, you know, because uh, as a leader, if, if you've got nobody following you, it means you're probably not a leader. You know, if, mm. if I feel like I'm a leader and I'm one of these guys that, uh, well, in fact, here's, here's an example. Uh, we had a guy, this is probably 15 years ago. He was a funny guy, but we had nobody taking leadership. And so finally I went to a couple of the players and I said, you know, right. You know, who's leading right now? The funny guy. He's just always having fun. He's making jokes. Everything's laughter. Da, 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 da. Are we getting better as a program? And do you want to get better as a program? Cause right now he's leading the team. Mm -hmm. and uh the one kid took it to heart and he put the kibosh to that and, he, and they were they were friends now, they were all seniors and uh you know so it's, it's those teachable moments again that i i think uh, i don't have a set mapped out 
big time plan. To me, it's, it's uh, day by day in a lot of respects. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and so coach, you had an incredibly successful career at Northwestern uh, up in St. Paul, where you went 112 and 51. And then you transitioned from there to Warner two years. This is your second year. As yeah, I started in 2017 at Warner. Okay. So yeah, it, so this will be my fourth season, second as the head coach. And so first off, what you know, made you want to leave, you know, you had a great setup at Northwestern. You obviously had a lot of success there. You know, what made you want to get up and go and leave and then take on Warner, which hadn't had as much success in the past. And, you know, has, has really been a, a development over the last, since 2017. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, uh, you know, um, first of all, I was getting restless. Mm -hmm. uh, I told my boss before the 2016 season, I went in and I said, uh, to the athletic director, I said, I think this may be my last season here. I don't know. I'm not putting my resignation as it's August. I mean, but right. I just, I just felt led that that was um, going to be the case. It, I just was feeling like I'm not doing as much as I could. Uh, I'm in my 30th some year coaching. I need something different and I'm not giving a hundred percent effort on this deal. And uh, so the Lord, uh, I thought it was done. And I was going to be back and it was going to be disappointing. And then all of a sudden, boom, uh, the uh, Warner defensive coordinator position opened up. I was friends with our current president uh, back 20 plus years previous at a different institution. And uh, we decided to make the, the change and move south. We'd been sort of looking at moving south. I had no idea it was ever going to be Florida. <laughs> we actually, my folks and my brother live in Texas. So we thought maybe that was going to be or Kansas, whatever the case. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and, and Warner, uh, up until that point, 2016, they, they'd kind of gotten better, better, better. And in 2016, had their best season. And then the mm. next year, uh, kind of just, we had a lot of the same guys back, but just didn't have the season that we were all expecting to have with that talent. And, sure. um, you know, sometimes things go south, but they go south for a reason. I was at Northwestern. We had the thing rolling and all of a sudden, boom, we go one and eight in the season. That's hmm. like, where did that come from? But yeah. uh, it, 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 it happens. And then we, we sort of had to start over. And uh, that's sort of what we're doing here at Warner. Well, and so, you know, going from Northwestern Division Three to Warner, which is NAIA, what, what are the differences in talent level? Is there a big difference? Um, and, and, you know, just the structure of the programs, how things are operated, you know, is there, what's that difference? Because I don't think many people really understand what that variance actually is. Yeah, first of all, you know, I always say football is football. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, certainly uh, the Alabamas and the Clemsons and the LSUs and the Minnesotas and the, the Washington Huskies and all, you know, it's, it's fun to play in front of 70, 100,000 people, but football is football. And mm -hmm. uh, so I always want uh, young men to know that playing the game is, is huge. But uh, as far as NAI and Division Three, they're very similar in a lot of ways. Obviously, in NAI, we can give scholarships, which uh, NCAA institutions can't. Sometimes they find ways to get men there financially, though, so you know that happens. Um, but, uh, you know, if you come into an NAI school, I mean, it's, it's probably, uh, from what I've seen, compared to the NCAA Division III, I would say we're probably trying to take it a more uh, a higher level as far as travel as far as um, game day approach, as far as gear, all those kinds of things. It looks more like a division one program at the NAI level, whether it's a smaller NAI school or, or a bigger NAI school, whereas you've got a lot more diversity in division three. Uh, it's got 240 schools in division three or more now. And wow. so the, you know, the dichotomy is just huge. Whereas NAI, I think there's definitely a lot more competition. Just look at, you know, how many different national championships champions there have been in NAI compared to Division Three in the last 20 years. Right, right. Sorry, right. it's kind of a long answer. I, I no, no. It, rabbit trails. It's a, it's a great answer. It's a great answer. <laughs> well, and so, you know, what are, what are some of, 
your hurdles with recruiting at the NAI le NAIA level now? Uh, I know you have a very specific recruiting strategy with a specific budget as to you know things mm -hmm. that you do, but you know how do you how do you attack that? How do you get some of these top these top talented guys in Florida to stay there to go to NAIA? Um, and yeah, I would just love to hear about what that process looks like for you. Yeah, I think the first thing is, like I said at the beginning, there's a spot for everybody, and we got some kids that got recruited. Um, somewhat heavily by D2 or other NAI schools. Uh, we've got a couple kids that got peaks by Division I schools. But I think the first thing is perception. You know, perception of the NAI is this and that and the other. And uh, until you actually come on board and start participating, um, you know, it's football and it's fast. It's faster than high school. Again, we're not claiming that we're the same as D2, although there's some you know, we have some NAI schools that have beaten D2 programs. And oh, yeah. Good D2 programs. So uh, the competition is really good. Um, but I think perception is probably the biggest thing. And then we're just not very well known. NAI. What's what's NAI? Right. I've been in other programs that have been NAI before. As far as the, the young men in Florida, uh, we're trying to recruit a specific kind of kid that's looking to be at a Christian institution for us. That's who we are. Uh, not every, obviously, NAI school is that way, although there's quite a few of them. And uh, there's a couple in Florida that we recruit against. But for the most part, uh, fit is everything. I found that out as a 28-year-old head coach. It's like, we want guys that even if you took football away, do they still want to be at Warner University? And is this a place where they want to gain an education for a lifetime? Because mm. it's going to be on their resume until the day they die. And then the friends that they have and the growth and the mentors that they may pick up as well. So, right. I don't know. I probably didn't, I probably answered your question in a more holistic approach than zeroing in on football. But. No, that's fantastic. And I mean, that's a huge point though. I think that is overlooked is that sometimes, you know, coaches, I think overlook the fact that the kid just isn't a good fit for his school in general. You know, they try to force him in there because of his athletic abilities and what they want for him to do on the field. But if, if they're not making sure that the other aspects of school life are equally as important and equally as fitting to the athlete, then, you know, that's going to screw up the athletic side as well. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, here's the thing that I've seen over the years, I haven't coached since the early eighties is that the coaches that are really becoming more successful, and I'm even including Nick Saban, although he does things quite a bit differently than uh, say Dabo Sweeney or PJ Fleck. But you look at the guys, the coaches that are really the successful one, it's the really young guys. They have passion, number one. They got talent. But then you look at Clemson. This was the first year that they actually made it into the top five or ten as far as their recruiting class. They haven't mm. even been close, and they're winning national championship because of what you're just saying and what I was saying is fit is everything. Right. Finally, I call it finally in tune with what that program is presenting and offering you. And, uh, you know, P.J. Fleck and, and Dabo Sweeney are the kings of that for sure. They, they would rather have a two-star and a three-star guy big time over a five-star guy that's not a fit. Right, right. And that, that's such an, an important and crucial piece that you're talking about between those two coaches specifically, because it's, it's the culture. And, and my question to you is, how, do you, how, do, how are those guys, types of guys able to build that culture? And how are they able to put those processes in place that say, this is our type of guy, and this is not this type of guy? And how do they get these players to buy into the program? Because their players are all in. Right. Yeah. The, you know, and, and their recruiting processes, they dig a heck of a lot deeper than we ever can because it ends up. And, and I hope we can slowly here at Warner get away from bringing in the big numbers, because when you're bringing in big numbers, you can't get to know a person nearly as well as these division one coaches. So they're doing a lot more research on these kids and spend a lot more time with them. And so that's that's one piece. Uh, right. I think, and, and we're not quite able to do that here, although uh, hopefully over time we can get closer to that model. Um, but yeah, but then, then it takes a while. I mean, we're still working and, you know, PJ Fleck calls it year zero, the first year he's a head coach of the program. Mm -hmm. It's just like mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. And I remember during the middle, I was like, I didn't know what he meant. And then finally in the middle of our season towards the end, really, uh, it's like, okay, I get it. Year zero. 
I'm thinking, well, just the kids are learning who we are and how we're operating. And me, especially as head coach, because I coach so out of the box. And I'm mm-hmm. going, wait a second. I've been here for two years, but I'm still learning just as much as these kids right. are about what's the best way to, to influence and impact these kids. And so it's a, it's a two-way street. Yeah, right. And if, if you haven't heard PJ Flex uh, talk about, uh, you know, year zero, basically he's referring to when you go transfer to another coaching program and it's your first year there, he refers to it as year zero because you're, you're getting acclimated to the program. Like you're saying, coach, uh, the players are getting accustomed to you and you're getting accustomed to the players. So that it does make more sense to hear you reaffirm what he talked about. It's, 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 it's a transition and you have to learn and you have to grow and you have to improve yourself as a coach and you have to learn how to coach guys differently. I mean, I can only imagine the types of guys you're getting in small town Florida are significantly different than the guys you're getting in St. Paul, Minnesota, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we recruit just Florida kids for, for part of the, that's that, you know, for that reason. Hell, mm-hmm. I can talk. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's no doubt there's just a different culture. One's not better than the other. There's a different culture in Minnesota and the Twin Cities, and there's a different culture. And certainly there's a different culture between Miami and, and um, you know, Lake Wells, Florida, where we're located kind of in the orange groves. And so uh, trying yeah. to find where that culture lands and – in the midst of these kids trying to figure it out themselves, that's, it's not an easy thing. Um, and my style isn't quite as, as uh, I'm different than PJ Fleck. I'm probably more of a facilitator than a head coach in a lot of respects, whereas okay. he's, he's the head coach. I mean, he makes it very clear that he's the head coach. I mean, he doesn't say that, mm-hmm. um, but having watched one of their practices and stuff like that. And, and he, he's probably though, he's probably the guy that's closest to how I like operating as far as division one coaches, if you look at him and dabble. Sure. Well, and how, what do you mean by you're more of a facilitator? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I probably need to demand more out of the coaches, but I'm more, Hey, uh, my coach used to always say it's gotta be a want to, not a have to. Mm-hmm. And certainly there's those times where, uh, I have to, as a head coach, make it a have to. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, really if I got to push and prod and challenge and, um, cajole people to do stuff, then, um, really they're doing it because I'm telling them they have to do it and I'm not going to get the most out of that person. Sometimes I'd have to do that. I mean, it's just a part of it. Just like, you know, with, with our kids, we, we learned from one of our coaches again, from, from this culture living down in Florida and small town and Florida in general, it's like, I'm not a, I'm not a real big believer in physical punishment when kids are late or this or that. Mm-hmm. But we finally realized that um, sometimes you just have to do that. You have to make <laughs> them run or do this, or that. And it's just never been anything that I learned growing up, but sometimes you got to make adjustments. And I think the best coaches do that. I'm not saying I'm a great coach, but you have to make adjustments. So Right. Right, right. Well, and I think those are the best, most successful coaches who are able to make adjustments based on their players. I think coaches get into trouble when they they think they have they they have the stock program, they have the way that they do things and the way that they coach, and and you can't coach the kid the same way that you coach another kid. You know, it's just everyone learns differently. Everyone, um, you know, needs to be punished differently, as you're saying. I mean you have to treat every kid on an individual basis. And if you don't do that, and if you're not willing to adjust, you're never going to be a successful coach. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, that's one of the things that I learned from uh, Bear Bryant years ago. I was him talking about how he adjusted and other people would talk about that played for him in the fifties compared to the late seventies, early eighties and how he had adjusted over the years. And I think Nick Saban has done that at Alabama himself. Uh, Mm -hmm. where he's adjusted quite a bit. Uh, We saw it with, we see it with Bill Belichick. Um, And, you know, he was fired with the Cleveland Browns. Now you say, (laughs) well, the Cleveland Browns and, you know, look at the Patriots. Well, the Patriots were kind of the Cleveland Browns of their era for a while there. So anyway, yeah. (laughs) People forget Um, that. (laughs) Beating a dead horse here, but yeah, we got to adapt. 
Absolutely got to adapt. Absolutely got to adapt. Well, and so uh, getting on the topic of international football, obviously with Podium, that was, you know, our initial niche. We work with over 400 teams across the world. We place athletes and coaches uh, all it. over. So, you know, guys that don't make the NFL, we take them and we, we place them in Europe or Mexico. You know, what was your experience with international football? Because we do have some contacts in England, David Hagar. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. I met David, who's now selling equipment. So, David, if you're there, little plug, um, plug. for you. But, uh, but yeah, I had uh, co been contacted by a semi-pro coach here when I was coaching in Wisconsin, a small little school called Mount Scenario, closed years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he contacted me and said, hey, do you want to bring your team over and play a game? It's only going to cost you the flight over for your whole team and then mm -hmm. one meal because they're all going to stay – in the dorms with the kids and then we'll pay for the meals. I was like, Excellent. how can you beat that? 500 bucks it cost our kids plus a meal, you know, That's whatever crazy. spending money. It, and yeah, it was a long time ago. It was uh, January, 1990, but to make a long story short. So we went over there, I get back and a coach had left the Lester Panthers last mm -hmm. minute, an American guy. And so this same guy calls me up that got us the bowl game over there and said, Hey, you want to coach in England? Be the head coach. I was like, yeah, if I could, if I could convince my president and athletic director to do that, I'll, I'll do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> anyway, that's how I got over there, and uh, yeah, it was quite the experience. He practiced two days a week, at least at that mm -hmm. time. That was, and I think that's pretty pretty normal yet. And then we played our games on Sunday afternoons. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of teams play on Saturday, but uh, across the globe, it's different everywhere. Yes, but it is. Uh, th I guess the. The thing that I found, the analogy was like softball here in the States. It's like, I tell guys, it's like you have this amateur softball league, you're 27 years old and you're playing, you still want to be active and think about bringing in a pitcher and a catcher, or a pitcher and somebody else, and you're paying them, you know, to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's just such a different flavor, but I love it. You know, these guys that, that have been playing and don't get paid a dime, I mean, they're actually sorry i'm I'm rambling i get passionate but no you know, they're, okay. they're paying for their own helmets shoulder pads i mean in a lot of these programs now some of them you know in, in some of these countries the clubs have made enough money to do that so anyway sorry, yeah I got, well I got yeah yeah up. no no to that point you know the thing that i always say is that athletes outside of the united states that play american football love the sport of american football more than the athletes in the u.s because they're not playing because it's cool they're not playing because they're probably going to get a scholarship they're playing because they love this sport There's and so a, a lot of times it's, it's a passion and a lot of it's cool to go over there and coach and play because they just eat up and soak up all the information you give them you know and because you're making them better and it's it's a fantastic thing and you know football in England is a little bit different than football in Germany, you know, in Germany, it's a lot more professional and some of these other countries, like it's becoming more professional. Like you said, like they have money now, now they can pay almost all their players. Um, and it's, it's, it's cool to see how it's de continuing to develop and they're continuing to get better players and more fans and international. I think it's going to continue to explode over the years to come. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, you know, I had that experience, and then ten years later, in two thousand, went to Brazil, Rio de Janeiro area, mm -hmm. and uh, teach us football. Teach us football. They, they oh, didn't yeah. know what it was. I mean, again, mm -hmm. to them, it's soccer is huge in Brazil, and um, so anyway, we we went out to the beach and tried to teach them, and they had they had absolutely no clue. And I, <laughs> and I, and I find out that they they started football in Brazil. I don't know, eight or nine, ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. and we had one of our players go down there and have his flight paid for, and he didn't get paid anything, but he had a free place to stay and a lot of free meals. And so yeah. it, it is, it's exploding across the globe while here in the United States, you know, we're going to see, especially with this, uh, pandemic, how, how this all plays out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's my biggest thing that I encourage guys is if you don't make the NFL, you should pursue an international career. You're going to travel the world. You're getting paid to go to other countries and you're getting, you're practicing, like you said, two to three times a week. And that's your only responsibility. You know, yeah. it's like, you're lift not going to get away. Yeah. They got mad at our guys when they didn't lift, you know, the Americans are like, 
you know, maybe last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, we have another kid. And again, I, I he, uh, this is his, well, they're not playing. I can't remember. I think he's finally made it to Germany, but he went from mm. Turkey to mm. France to somewhere else, yeah. or maybe France. And then now he's in Germany, which is kind of the Mecca of, uh, uh, international football outside the, right. you know, the, the, uh, con uh, the right. Western hemisphere, I guess I should say. Um, yes. Yes. Well, that's fantastic. Well, and so coach, a uh, couple more topics here. Um, yeah. you're more of a defensive guy than offensive guy, right? Or what's your, yeah, I've been more defense over the last 20 years. Uh, I actually played defense in college and then I wanted to be a coordinator uh, before I became a head coach on both sides of the ball, because that's just what I learned from my mentors. And, and I was on the offensive side for a number of years and then got back on defense by default. And I uh, love it. I don't know if I'd ever go back to offense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so, Coach, tell us, what is your favorite defensive uh, – what's your, what's your favorite defense? I mean, what's your, what's your go-to uh, set? Yeah, you know, I – I've done so many different things defensively. I mean, we were a four, four, which now it's called a four, two, five, you know, just cause everybody throws and we were four, four. It was, um, you know, everybody was running the ball and uh, we did a, we did a six, two, which is a version of the four, four man front. Uh, I've done a three man front. So I don't have necessarily a favorite, but you know, the one thing, Will, that I would say is if somebody said, we want you to be a defensive coordinator again at the high school level or something of that nature, I'd find something that's going to fit the personnel that I sort of know is already there and uh, then focus on fundamentals because especially at the high school level, but it's the same thing at the college level, maybe not quite as diverse as it used to be, but especially at the high school level, every scheme has won a state championship you name it they've won it and it's the same thing on the offensive side of the ball I probably know the 425 the best uh, and that's actually what we did here at um, but it was we, we had a lot of different idiosyncrasies that that we hadn't done where I was at before so I was learning to, Ron Scarlett was actually you know he knew our defense better than I did the two years I coordinated so but we were a 425 uh, the thing I like about the three four is now I can do a lot more diff a lot more things with uh, looks and blitzing and personnel and in Florida it's all about speed right mm -hmm. so I didn't really answer your question because to be honest uh, I don't know what I'd do <laughs> <laughs> no no you did you did the four two five is the most common I think well and um, and so I mean disrupting offenses I mean what is your, I mean, in regards to the defenses that you're running, I mean, are you a more aggressive defense? Are you more passive? Are you sitting back in coverage in the four, two, five? Like what is your, you know, what is your tendency? It, you know, it, and again, I'm talking not necessarily about our defense because uh, I let uh, Ron and his staff do their thing. Um, so I'm talking more in general, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I do believe as a head coach, and I told our staff this yesterday, that putting pressure on the quarterback is probably number one in, in, in these days of how offenses are playing the game, um, putting pressure. I did a study, a self-study, and this, this included many years where everybody ran the football, but at Northwestern, the 15 or 16 years that I, was, that I did the study, the number one statistic, you know, was the score. Hello. The second mm -hmm. one was turnovers, which people talk about all the time. The third one for us over those 16 years, and it was a distant third, but it was sacks. Wow. It was sacks. Wow. Putting pressure on the quarterback. So that's, you know, whether it doesn't necessarily have to be five-man pressure. It doesn't even have to be six-man pressure. It's putting pressure on the quarterback as far as his uh, his reads, maybe first and foremost, maybe that's how you're going to approach it. For me, I'm not a big five-man pressure guy as much anymore, just because it's, if you're doing zone blitz, which is what I did the last time I really coordinated. And again, it was a little different here at Warner Coordinate compared to uh, where I was at Northwestern. But I just found people were too smart zone blitz they knew exactly hot hit the hot so i got out of it. the last two or three years that i i coordinated uh all on my on my own sort of uh 
I just quit blitzing. I think we blitzed like three times in two seasons. Wow. And then we were one of the top defenses in our in our conference. So so again, it's more about keeping it sound and simple and understanding how to make adjustments. You know, it's uh, so sorry I start rambling again, but yeah, no, no, adjustments no. are huge. Yes. Yeah, during yes. a game. They don't have to be big. You don't want them to be big because you don't want to change something you've done all practice all week and then all of a sudden you do something different. But sometimes you just have to make adjustments. Right, right. Well, it seems like you, you made the adjustment to be more passive than you previously were at the D3 level when you got to Warner just because, like you said, they're, they're hitting you in the hot reads and they're taking advantage of all those blitzes. So right. you know, letting the offense make a mistake instead of trying to bring that pressure – um, you know, worked out better yeah. for you in the, in the future. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's for the most part, I mean, that's who we've been at, at Warner, you know? Um, so it's like, if I was doing high school football, I would, I think I'd, I told, uh, just do cover three variations of all cover three, because it's really stop the big plays. We want to make mm -hmm. big plays on offense and that's our philosophy. We want to stop big plays on defense. Got it. Got it. Well, coach, so uh, what is what is your ideal recruit look like for you? I mean, um, you know, athletically, uh, academically, person in the community, you know, what, what type of guy do you want to bring into your program to, 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 to later become one of those leaders that we previously discussed? Sure. Yeah. Well, like I said, fit, finally in tune with what we're doing and, and certainly guys are getting recruited they have a hard time. Um, they're not really understanding what that means, even though I stand in front of them and tell them, this is what our program's about and get online and look and all those kinds of things until you, mm -hmm. until they get there. So, but what are we looking for? Um, probably the first thing that we're looking at, because we can just look at a, a screen and say, yep, he's a fit that direction uh, without even talking to him or watching film. And that's the academic side. Mm -hmm. um, looking at GPA, which is to me way more important than ACT or SAT score. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather have a guy with a 297 uh, GPA and a 15 ACT. If they can get into school, you know, that mm -hmm. would be tough to get into school. It's not uncommon at, at Warner. Um, but I would much rather have that than a guy with a 2.46 that scored a 27 on his, AT, on his ACT. I mean, mm -hmm. now right away what kind of work ethic do they have because it correlates in my opinion no research specifically on this but their gpa and how hard they're working in the classroom really is a reflection as well on the football field so that's the first thing is kind of look and i told this staff you know we want everybody above a 275 as best we can mm -hmm. and again we're gonna we're gonna admit some kids uh, that are under that so Anybody that's listening to this is like, oh, I got a 2.4. I'm not going to get in. You know, that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing would be certainly looking at their film. There's a lot of guys in Florida that uh, are fast. And uh, so speed is really what we're looking for on that. But the fundamentals of the game, the fundamentals right. of the game is huge. Uh, you know, is, is a guy, and this is where a player can't always um, – necessarily control this but if they're inside a linebacker and they're blitz and blitz and blitz and blitz and almost every play i can't really tell how good a football player they are right, you know? uh, right. And we did that a ton back in the day i mean we blitzed every down pr pretty much almost when i was at mount scenario my first couple of years coaching so there's nothing wrong with that uh but it's just harder to get a read on a kid i want a kid on defense or offense that's doing fundamentals how are they running their routes you know, receiver, is he going up and after the football or mm -hmm. is he letting the ball come to him? Those kinds of things. And then Absolutely. lastly, certainly talking to the coach and talking to the young man, um, you know, do you have a passion for football? Uh, and, you know, what's your work ethic like? Would you want, and I haven't asked this question enough, would you really want to be at Warner heaven forbid you get injured and can't play again, or you choose not to play anymore. Do you want to be at Warner to get your degree? And I'd like to believe that that happens, whether it's at the division one level or small college level, the kids that we're recruiting um, and, and programs are recruiting kids. that are going to fit that particular school. Like we've talked about previously. Right. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and that obviously 
the more time and the, the more thorough of an interview process that you take with the kid, it makes for less surprises down the line, right? I mean, if, if you can do that initial investment of studying the kid up front, you're going to know the type of kid you're getting in. And then when he gets there, he's hopefully going to live up to the standards that you expect, right? And, and that's a big hope. Uh, this is has not happened often, but once in a while, you get kids that uh, – are much better than you thought or not nearly as good as you thought mm. on the field or off the field. Uh, we had a kid, his dad was a youth pastor, small town, you know, in Iowa of all places, did a home visit, which I've, I'm not a big home visit guy. Uh, mm -hmm. For whatever reason, not good, bad or ugly. You just don't. <laughs> okay. Maybe this is why. So we go do a home visit. I remember myself and the office of coordinator, we, we got in the car and said, that was a little different. And uh, so there was a little bit of a flag, but not much. I mean, we were a Christian school at the last place I was at. This guy was a pastor, you know, his son playing football, good player, da, 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 da. Fi come to find out, you know, he's smoking dope. He's been selling it. Da, 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 da. That oh, was wow. the worst. That was the worst season in the history of, of my head coaching right there is, is because we had all of a sudden we get these kids that say they're a fit and they really want to be at this Christian school and, and they're doing stuff like that, which, you know, it was just like, that was, that was rough. That was the year we won one game, you know, yeah. because these kids said they were fits. They sort of misrepresented themselves or maybe because their parents forced them to come. I have no idea, hmm. but, but we've also gotten the exact opposite where kids have come in, they're really rough around the edges. And man, by the time they leave, the maturity level has gone from here to, you know, up here. So it goes both directions. One, how proud, how proud do you get of those kids that come in rough that, you know, develop through the program and through what you're teaching them? I mean, how, what, what sense of pride do you oh, have? Oh my those gosh. Guys? And, um, you know, some of the best moments that I've had is when I'm having a rough day and it doesn't happen a lot. But I've, it's happened a number of times, and all of a sudden I get an email or uh, a letter in the mail. This is, it's been a while because I've moved around and things are different. It's tweet, tweet this or say it on direct message or whatever. But, um, you know, all of a sudden you get something positive. I had a kid write a letter. Um, it was about 10 years later um, just saying, Coach, you know, I was kind of shook my head. Actually, two guys did this from two different programs. Kind of shook my head at what you're saying. I didn't understand it. I didn't necessarily agree. Da, 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 da. But now I have kids and I get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So now it's they like, get it. I mean, what those are cherished moments for sure that, um, you know, you, you are. You're proud of these guys. And the guys that I've come to know and probably know the best are the guys that got in trouble. Hmm. Now I got to meet with them. You know, the school says, or I've said, okay, we need to start meeting. Yeah. And it's just, it's, you know, now it's human being to human being rather than head coach, you know, you drank and you weren't supposed to, and you know, that kind of thing. But there's a humanness that's involved. And, and for me as a Christian, I mean, there's, there's a love and um, that's that only uh, Christ can show us that, through the Holy Spirit, then we're, we're able to to do those kinds of things. So that's that's my belief. But well, and and leading to to the final uh, topic, I mean that's so powerful what you're talking about in in the sense of leading men and you know the love of of your your Christian faith and um, you know what has a sport of football meant to you? What has leading young men for the last thirty plus years as a profession meant to you? And would you, could you have ever, I mean, would you have rather have been doing anything else in the world than besides coaching? Yeah. Football? You know, that's a great question. I, I've grown so much because of my wife and because of my job, um, mm. because I always wanted to integrate my faith from the first time that I went to Pacific Lutheran, which is where I went and Frosty, heard Frosty Westering. It's like, I want to coach football and I want to impact and influence young men. Now, early on, I thought I knew what that meant, but but as time has gone, but, uh, you know, absolutely. It's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, the, the growth has just been tremendous because I've learned, cause I've had to preach a couple times. It's like, I know I'm learning more mm -hmm. as, the, as the person that's going to give the sermon, 
than probably the people that I'm going to be talking to because I'm living it out. I'm doing research, all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's the same thing for me is I've been growing in my faith tremendously because I want to challenge these guys in their faith. And um, I think the only place I probably would have grown more was as a pastor, but mm. any other job, uh, you know, other than coaching basketball or hockey or whatever, which is still coaching. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I could have grown as much as I am in this position. And yeah, it's to be able to coach. It's like coaching, especially full time. Are you kidding me? I'm getting paid to coach full time. It's not even a job. I mean, their headaches, no doubt. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I want to toss it, but what a better, what a better job in the country and what the greatest sport in the world. Uh, and, and the rest of the world's finding that out to teach life to young men and women. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's not a better sport. There's not a better sport in the world. And, you know, quite frankly, that's why we came up with the, the football excellent podcast, football excellence podcast was because of guys like you coach that are looking to lead young men that are doing things right in the football world and taking this sport that we all love with all of our hearts and bringing it to the next level. So absolutely. it's awesome. Appreciate you so much for being on the show. It was yeah, great. As well. Hey, it's great. I love your passion and enthusiasm. And I, I love the fact even more so that you're taking that passion and enthusiasm, just like you said, and you're influencing and impacting young men in, in a different way than, than we are as coaches. But uh, we need the, the wills just as much as we need the Kirks. <laughs> well i appreciate that coach it really means a lot coming from you so appreciate it you enjoy your time on florida you be safe during this quarantine and we'll talk to you soon all right stay away from them cliffs <laughs> i will buddy you take care all right bye. take care bye